Okay, hi there and uh, welcome to another in our series of special videos looking at aspects of the coronavirus uh, crisis, the epidemic, the pandemic and the economic crisis. COVID-19 transmission is dictated by human behaviour. Uh, so can behavioural psychology be used to help change the choices that people make? Well, in this short video, let's spend a few minutes looking at some of the key uh, relevant if you like, behavioural biases identified and link them to attempts being made across the world to reduce the spread of infection and mitigate the huge human cost of coronavirus. In economics, the standard theory is that agents, consumers and businesses act with pure rationality. Uh, well, that's, that assumption has been ditched now for some time as behavioural economics has come into prominence. We know that, for example, people have a very limited ability to calculate. They may not be able to work out all the, the, uh, the costs and benefits of a choice uh, may not be, they may find it difficult to calculate and computate uh, risk, particularly at times of great uncertainty. Individual choices are not made in isolation, if you pardon the pun, but the choices we make are intensely, insanely affected by oftentimes overlapping social networks, the people we engage, click and connect with. And decisions taken in cold light of day are often very different from the choices we make when we're getting emotional. People don't necessarily act in their own pure self-interest. They may be altruistic. They may give as much as they take in particular. Uh, and we often see community action becoming uh, quite paramount at times of, of social stress. Uh, we often have a desire for instant rewards. Uh, we want to cash out uh, as soon as we can. Uh, we want this crisis to be over as soon as we can. But do people necessarily have the patience uh, for the worst to, to get through the worst? And our choices, oftentimes day to day, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, our choices are hardly hardwired to stay to the default. Very, very hard choices to shift. So challenge the assumption of rationality, particularly in these times. Let's quickly go through. I'm going to choose seven behavioural biases to the coronavirus crisis. I posted a note in Facebook early on today and psychology and economics teachers were overloading me with fantastic examples of how you can apply the, the, the coronavirus crisis to psychology and economics. I've picked out seven uh, particular biases. One is herd behaviour, uh, the bandwagon effect. We've seen that, of course, uh, in, in the way that people have rushed to supermarkets and engaged in panic buying. We're seeing it now as the government, if de facto, imposes uh, a lockdown. Uh, and uh, tries to encourage us to engage in social distancing. We are we are herd animals. We are social people, uh, and the herd behaviour is is really important. Another bias is something called the status quo bias. You know, following daily routines is uh, is part and part and part of parcel of our of our daily life. Uh, we have a very strong default behaviour, and that can be actually very good. Organising a default routine when uh, when you're stuck at home. But those defaults are quite hard to change. Uh, defaults about washing your hands, for example. Defaults about uh, shaking hands and other forms of human contact and touching your face. Those, some of those defaults are hardwired into our psychological profiles. Very hard to change, but oftentimes they do need to change for collective action to be achieved. A third key bias is something called loss aversion. Uh, we tend to feel the effects or the impact of a loss the pain of loss more than a gain. Uh, well, an application could be the fact we've now lost most of our freedom of movement, certainly for the next few weeks, possibly months. People may have bought tickets to Glastonbury or tickets to the Reading and Leeds festivals and those events are being cancelled. Obviously, uh, there could be some refunds, but the actual uh, the expectation of going to these things uh, can impose quite a severe mental, uh, mental loss on, on people. Interestingly, I think the loss you feel is probably mitigated if, if other people are in the same boat. The collective sense of loss can sometimes reduce the individual sense. And there's also something called normalcy bias. Normalcy bias. Hard word to spell that one. Funny word, isn't it? Also known as the ostrich, ostrich effect, which is basically we put our head in the sands and we pretend things have, haven't changed when in fact the evidence suggests they have. Very interesting, I was reading a survey in, in the New Scientist just this afternoon. They did a, they did a, a survey of respondents and 
Of that survey, 50% of people saying they were avoiding social events and only 36% were avoiding um, public transport. Uh, and yet most people think that a crowded tube train is, is a much bigger transmitter of, of the disease than perhaps uh, filling, filling a park or, or walking on a beach or going to a, a slightly less concentrated social gathering. About two thirds of people in the UK say they have changed their behaviour in some way based on government advice. Only about a half of young people aged 18 to 24 have done so, so far. A fifth bias is the overconfidence bias, sometimes called the hot hand fallacy. Uh, people think they're on a winning streak. People think that they are invincible, immune. Uh, and of course, they're not. Young people in particular may well be underestimating the risk of contracting uh, coronavirus. So just look at the behaviour of young people uh, in Florida on the spring beach breaks. Then there's a couple more I just wanted to share with you. One is really interesting. It's called the one model thinking bias. This applies particularly to policy makers, uh, people in government, for example, and perhaps the experts surrounding the politicians. And one thinking thinking, one model thinking bias can happen when uh, we become too focused, too certain, if you like, that, that there's only one solution to a problem. And of course, the world is complex, it's messy, it's non-linear. Uh, there is no, very rarely, one solution to the problem. I'll give you an example of that in a second. Zero risk bias is my favourite bias at the moment. It's a, a really good example of why, in particular, people have panic buyed and gone gangbusters in buying you know, 3,000 toilet rolls. Zero risk bias is when people want some certainty, particularly at times of uncertainty. And they may well be prepared to take quite big steps to reduce the risk to zero. Think of an example. If I offered you two choices, choice one would be something which reduces the risk of something from 55% down to 50%. And choice two reduces the risk from 5% to zero. Now, of course, they're both the same choices. The risk comes down by 5%. Uh, can you imagine what will happen if you ask the people this? Well, most people would choose the risk reduction from five to zero because the power of zero, they want that sense of certainty that something uh, is, uh, is going to happen. So when you think about panic buying of toilet rolls, for example, you know, if, you, if you manage to escape Aldi or Tesco uh, with 300 toilet rolls, you know for a fact you're not going to run out of toilet roll, even though it's probably too much. Uh, we mentioned the, the one model bias. Look at the famous duck rabbit image. You may well have seen this before. What do you see? Do you see a duck or do you see a rabbit? Most people see a duck initially. If you tilt your head to the left, you may well see a rabbit. But it's quite impossible uh, to see both at once. And oftentimes people only see one thing when in fact there may be two or three particular uh, options and solutions down the line. An example in the context of coronavirus, I think, is is the almost obsession with flattening the curve, social isolation and mitigating through that mechanism, as opposed to testing the population. In particular, testing and testing and testing those people um, who may well have had it over the last two months. OK, I just want to take you through a few examples of uh, of uh, biases and also some ideas of behavioural nudges. Great article by Tom Chivers in uh, Unheard, which is about this the economics and the psychology of panic buying. Um, yeah, panic buying is it is it irrational to go to the supermarket and hoard uh, basic essentials like pasta and and uh, milk and what have you and toilet rolls and and cowpaw. Well, despite its name, panic buying is not always driven by strong emotions. It can actually be a natural, in fact, a rational response of people who don't like risk and don't like um, uncertainty. So there, here's a famous quote from a, in the article. It's so selfish, said one mother. What if my kid gets ill? But of course, everyone else is thinking the exact same thing. And that is why there is no cowpaw. Game theory, the prisoner's dilemma, the tragedy of the commons, if we all use up a, a common resource, that resource is depleted. I'll post a link to Tom's article in the comment section of this video. Finish off by thinking a little bit about nudges in the wild. This is the idea of how um, governments, businesses, people 
are trying to use behavioural nudges to try to uh, change behaviour to help mitigate the effects of the crisis. A nudge, if you follow the work of Thaler and Sunstein, uh, is basically a change to the environment in which choices are made. Maybe it's to choice architecture by framing things in slightly different ways. Let's have a look at a few examples. And if you can send me some other examples which you find um, in the media, please post them in the comment section of the video. It would be fantastic to get some more nudges in the wild. Not everybody's getting it right, by the way. Here was the Daily Mail last weekend suggesting that people uh, should escape the cities and head to the, to the countryside, to the coast, to the wilderness. Clearly a uh, suboptimal thing for people to do because you're then spreading the risk of disease and putting uh, undue pressure on um, lo fairly poorly resourced local health authorities. And here's another example which was posted by somebody today at a railway station of Vanti West Coast Line. Perhaps they got the timing wrong. Whoever's doing the marketing needs to think, on the day we move to lockdown, this is probably not the best advertising campaign to run. Probably. A choice architecture is really interesting. Choice architecture is simple nudges in the way that choices, uh, the sequencing of a choice can be changed. I love this example from a Danish supermarket. Little signs put on the floor, they'll be temporary, or who knows, they might be permanent, but little signs, two metres apart, this is where you should stand. It's simple, it works, it's clean, it's clear, and it's a great behavioural nudge. A really interesting paper by the Professor of Psychology at Stanford. He thinks that we should change the framing of which the framing in which the choice is made. So reframing behaviour. We've been told at the moment to socially distance. Well, why not change that from social distancing to physical dis distancing? Or well, actually flip it on its head, given the ubiquity of social media, of Zoom, of Teams, of you know FaceTime, of all that kind of stuff. Why not move from social distancing to distant socialising? We can still be creative and collaborative and social even from a distance. We don't necessarily have to distance ourselves. So physical distancing and distant socialising is a way of reframing the choice. You may well have found on the internet loads of really powerful messages from frontline healthcare workers, uh, including anaesthetists and uh, you know, the key workers operating the, uh, the, the, the ventricle machinery, efficient messaging, powerful messaging can appeal strongly to social norms and that of course can be amplified through social media as a nudge. And clear messaging is also clear messaging also very important to understanding our uh, improving our understanding of risk. Most people do not fully understand uh, how um, you know the, the degree of social contact can amplify the spread of of any virus in particular coronavirus. So clear, simple infographics help people to make better decisions. We live in a world, of course, of social influences, from premiership footballers to YouTube stars and politicians. Here's a photo from the media last week. Angela Merkel. Uh, well, what do you see in this photo? What do you see? Take a moment, perhaps, and think about what you see in this photo. Uh, some people, I've asked my students, they, they spot the, the four bottles of wine. Uh, they also spot the fact that she's probably shopping quite frugally. She's only buying what she needs. There's no evidence here of panic shopping, it's trying to send a message to people. Just live life as normally as you can. Andrew Cuomo, the uh, mayor of New, mayor of, uh, governor of New York City, uh, mayor of New York City, incredibly important job he has as the epidemic really takes hold in that state. And he's been using unorthodox messaging in particular to target a key demographic, young people who are not fully complying with social distancing regulations uh, as well as uh, moral suasion. Simple message to young people, you are wrong. That is unorthodox. Uh, the question is, is it effective as a nudge? Some people are signing up to make commitments. So sometimes a pre-commitment device is a way of changing behavior. Here's a good example. You can sign up uh, to a website where you pledge to clean my hands. Cover your mouth, keep your distance and care for others. Simple pledge. Oftentimes when you make a pre-commitment, that reinforces the behaviours that you want to encourage. Just finishing off and thinking about this, you know, the spread of a transmittable disease is essentially a collective action problem. 
It's the amalgamation, it's the aggregate of millions and millions of decisions that we're all taking individually every morning, every afternoon, every evening. So how can we reduce the spread from a behavioural point of view? We have to find mechanisms by which we generate cooperation at many levels, at local, national and also at global level. It requires a degree of altruism, you know, giving something, supporting somebody without necessarily wanting uh, something back. Uh, it requires trust, it requires a, a strong sense of social capital, a sense that we're all in it together. And of course it clearly, clearly requires, a, a, a requires a degree of self-sacrifice, uh, a willingness to put away the need for immediate gratification uh, for the longer term good of, of community. It also requires some degree of enforcement for non-compliance. It could be financial penalties. Some countries have serious fines if you're caught out of, out of a home without a, a valid reason. Or it could be social opprobrium. The social norm could be that these kinds of behaviours become similar to drunk driving or driving under the influence uh, of drugs or speeding or smoking in a, in a crowded place. You know, social norms of behaviour may well change. The last point I want to make is that many people are conditional cooperators. They're willing to cooperate. They want to cooperate. They see the social good, but they're more likely to cooperate if they see other people doing the same. And we're not getting kind of free riders who are taking a ride, taking a benefit without paying some of the costs. There we go. Uh, some thoughts from me on aspects of coronavirus and behavioural economics. I'm going to do a second video looking at where the behavioural nudge theory uh, is going to be is taking a bit of a hit at the moment in the UK context. Thanks for joining in.